Last week, we learned that while the information we know about AI may have origins in science fiction, much of what we watch in the movies or read in the science fiction novels doesn't present the full picture. We're continuing our conversation with Dr. John Wyatt of the University College London and Dr. Scott Hawley of Belmont University as we conclude. Okay, while we may not trust AI, and while a lot of people fear the future, whether that's Paper clips. Yeah, paper clips. <laughs> or or losing their job. Yeah. Or, you know, the, the the complete destruction of human civilization. There are some concerns that humans can't be trusted with the world either. Mm. There was a story a 2015 hit called Hitchbot. A team of Canadians created a hitchhiking robot as a social experiment. The idea was to have this little bot travel the globe collecting photos and recording human interaction, and all went well until someone decapitated it in Philadelphia. Um, what are some of the dangers of human interaction with AI, Scott? You know, that reminds me of uh, the night scope security robots that have been deployed in a few places. Um, one of them ran over a small child. <laughs> Another one got attacked by a bunch of kids. You see this video of, of kids kicking the robot. And some people even applauded this. Wired Magazine ran a story entitled, Of Course Citizens Should Be Allowed to Kick Robots. And um, I'm not sure I agree that people should just have carte blanche to destroy other people's property. But I think anthropomorphism, I'm going to say this word again and again, maybe perhaps not a danger, but at least it's a significant challenge. You know, on the one hand, we want to keep in mind that we're dealing with a machine. We're dealing with a thing. But on the other hand, um, actually, this is featured in... Uh, John has a colleague at the Faraday Institute, Beth Singler. She had a great video on robots. At one point, they're pointing out that anthropomorphism is an unavoidable human tendency. You know, you can paint a face on a coffee can, and some people are going to start treating it like it's a living thing. And so how can people design systems, for example, in, in social settings like elder care and whatnot, to design systems that don't exploit this tendency towards anthropomorphism in some inappropriate way, um, such as, you know, to engender, sometimes it gets called moral patency, the idea that you have some kind of moral obligation to a machine that could be exploited by companies that want to make you really care about their product in ways that aren't really in the user's best interest. Can I, can I jump in really quickly before you answer, John? Uh, what do you think about uh, the work that's being done at MIT, uh, I think it, what, what is her name? Dr. Rosalind Picard mm -hmm. uh, and some other yeah. people that are working on having the, creating these, as I understand it, they're basically creating robots that help children with autism uh, to understand how to interact with people. Social because cues. Because the robots yeah. give them the social cues in a more direct and, and way and they mirror it, whatever. And so anyway, the kids get these little robots and they play with them and they learn how to interact with people. What do you think about that in light of what you just said? We're going to see um, capabilities that can be applied either in positive ways or in ways that we might uh, have problems with. So to me, that sounds like a good use of this sort of thing. On the other hand, some of these systems that are intended to diagnose or to, you know, understand human emotions and motivations can get applied in uh, some not so great ways. So, for example, we're seeing companies sell software for conducting interviews. And you put a camera on the interviewee and the AI is using its quote unquote emotional AI to deduce all manner of things about the interviewee that may or may not have any basis in scientific fact. And it's kind of the wild west out there. We talked about regulation. You know, I think we're going to see that kind of thing become outlawed, where you can't just focus some machine learning model on a human being and trust that it's telling you whether the person is lying or not or whether this person is honest or if they're faking things. Um, and yet it seems like in situations where there are demonstrated improvements, for example, with these autistic children, it sounds like that could be a good application. Yeah, the assets and defects of, of AI. And I guess that's a very thin razor to tread. Yes, I agree. I, I think the, the thing about this anthropomorphism, our ability to respond to a thing as though it's a human person, 
is it's very deep rooted in our human makeup. Uh, it, it's it seems to be this, this kind of there's certain circuits within the brain that are um, involved in our social relationships in being able to read faces and understand emotions and so on with, with other human beings. And there have been studies using brain scanners showing that if you take a, a humanoid robot and you do do something nasty to them, you know, you like you you stick them with a knife or you twist their arms or something like that. The same circuits are activated in the watcher and the human watcher's brain as though you were doing it to a human being, as though you were torturing a human being. And I mean, this makes me think that they're going to have to be regulations about what you're allowed to do to a robot, not because of the damage you could do to the robot, but because of the damage that you might do to the human beings. Um, and, uh, you know, that's a weird kind of thing, but this is a, a very powerful force. And I, I agree with Scott that I think that there is going to have to be regulation. But having said that, because the companies deliberately go down this route, uh, because it, it, it makes what they call a sticky product, it makes us, you know, they want us to develop a relationship with these machines. Um, you know that's why Alexa is is has got all the intonations of a human voice. Um, I, I heard a little child who was going off uh, uh, on a holiday with a family, and and she said to the others, "We've got to take Alexa with her because with us because she's part of the family." Ah, they say, "See, already there is the, that. This is kind of just." And that's what the companies want. They want us to build up these relationships. That's that sticky product because you got to bring Alexa with you to the beach. Okay. Holy cow. So this is going to move into something that I think both of you have shared you have an interest in, and that's the concept of ethics. Um, thinking about a movie like Ex Machina, it paints a dark, sinister element to AI. So, John, what about the ethics involved in AI? How far is too far, or is there a limit? So, this is the, going back to the theme of science fiction, that um, so, uh, movies like Ex Machina um, are really scientifically very unrealistic. I mean, we are decades away from being able to create a robot who really behaves in that very human fashion. So to me, the, where the ethics comes is not that we might accidentally create a machine that is going to be super intelligent and, and dominate the world. It's much more what evil human beings can do with a machine, the way that they can use a machine to manipulate and fool and uh, coerce. And uh, so... I, I think there are some real ethical questions there. And, and you know, it, it's rather sort of tragic, isn't it, in a way? You know, Mark Zuckerberg says, well, I just want to connect every human being on the planet. You know, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> and yet, you know, the history then, you think of all the evil things that have come out of Facebook. You know, people have died as a result. There have been yeah. horrific things that have happened simply from connecting people one-to-one. To, one to one. I have a, a sort of hunch that part of the problem is the very disembodied nature of digital communication and interaction. We're created as embodied people, we're as, as located in space and time, and, we, and when we talk to one another face to face, there's all kinds of limitations which come from our embodiment. Um, and it's been shown that people are often much more cruel in the digital space. They, wouldn't, sure. they would never say something to someone's own face, right? but they just sort of fire off some horrific sort of trolling comments. So there's something about the disembodiment which draws evil tendencies out of human beings. And so how we restrain that, What, how regulation can restrain the evil consequences. So it, it is this uh, curious thing that our technology can be used for wonderful good uh, but at the same time, it can be used in military applications. It can be used in, in uh, commercial abuse, manipulation, uh, and so many negative things can use the very same self-same technology. 
Yes, that's an excellent point. Wow. And you mentioned a little bit too, John, when you talked about some of these nuclear um, capabilities, uh, we have evidence, we can watch what's going on. But with this, it's in the dark, it's not exposed, we have no idea what's going on. And then you do have the sinister uh, manifestation of that. So that's an excellent point. Wow. What, what about you, Scott? I wholeheartedly agree with John. Um, one of the quotes that I sort of keep in mind in thinking about these sorts of things is a media scholar named uh, Zainab uh, Tufeci, and she says, too many people worry about what AI, as if it's some independent entity, is going to do to us. Too few people worry what power will do with AI, what people in power will do wow. with AI. Wow. And I think that is the main, you know, kind of narrative. We're seeing an increasing centralization of control and power and manipulation um, that scales out to all kinds of other people. And um, it's not so much a matter of Skynet taking over the world as just the world being, yeah, manipulated and run by various other people. So I think that's a concern. In terms of ethics of how we use AI, there's a separate conversation about how do we program AI systems so that they behave in a manner that is consistent with human ethical values. But um, that's not a conversation that I follow as closely as I do the ethical use of AI technology by human beings. Wow. Those I are have, excellent I have points. not thought about the difference between the two. Yeah, excellent points. Okay, so if AI in some instances can outperform humans, we think about IBM's Watson on Jeopardy! or the Human Diagnosis Project that helps with diagnosis and collaboration between doctors. Are we close to cracking the Turing test when a robot can pass as a human and not be detected? How are all these AI-related things influencing the future? Um, shall, I, shall I take that? I, I, I think the Turing test was uh, originally designed as, as a way to see whether you could fool human beings you know whether um i i think sadly that's happening all the time on social media we know that there are many sort of excellent points. bots which people think are human beings and in fact they are programs you know there have been examples of human beings think you know developing a romantic relationship with this woman on the other side of the world and having a whole series of text messages and, and then discovering that actually it was just a bot yeah. Um, so, so it is already happening in that in that kind of sense. And but again, it's often being because people are manipulating. This is you know, it's evil human beings who are behind this with their own motivation. Uh, and, and also, one of the curious things about human beings is that we have this desire to be deceived. I mean, there's a very famous case way back in the very early history of computing when a computer program called ELISA was created. It was a very, very simple program, which just simply, you typed in a question. You said, um, I'm, I'm feeling sad today. And the program said, why are you feeling sad today? And then, you know, just it was a very simple, just turn the question around. But anyway, you found that straight away, and this was back in the 60s, people were having private sessions with ELISA, were pouring out their deepest thoughts. And, um, you know, and 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 were utterly convinced that this machine was was reading into their their, their deepest thoughts. So, so this phenomenon that that people are sometimes more honest with the machine yeah. than they are with a human being, and, and more prepared to be intimate with the machine than they are with a human being, is a sort of bizarre quirk of human nature. <laughs> Um, so again, it's just this is why we're, we are wide open to be manipulated or abused, mm. and uh, how are we going to try and limit and regulate this? Uh, at the moment, is not at all clear. We well, and you also mentioned earlier in that word disembodied. Mm -hmm. When evil humans and manipulation and people who want to be deceived disembody themselves. We do keep the door wide open. Yeah. You know, when you're meeting someone face to face, it's much harder to fool someone. Of course, sadly, it's still possible. There are Absolutely. Con, sure. con artists and, you know, yeah. actors and all the rest. But, but it becomes that much easier mm -hmm. for deception to take place uh, when you're on the net. And 
And uh, we know that there are predatory people out there uh, who are just surfing the net to find people, others who they can manipulate and abuse. Scott, what do you think? Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting. Earlier today, I was just reading a new article in uh, MIT Tech Review from uh, Oren Etzioni, who's uh, CEO of the Allen Institute for AI in Seattle. And uh, it's called, uh, let's see, uh, How to Know if Artificial Intelligence is About to Destroy Civilization. And one of the points that he's making is in these situations where AI systems are outperforming human beings in very specialized sorts of tasks, uh, that it's still humans that have to set everything up. It's the humans who pose the question in the first place. It's the humans that go and get the data to do it. Uh, and that this is, he makes the point this is very different from human intelligence, where a human says, well, you know, I, I have some goal. For example, a teenager says, I, I want to be more independent from my parents so that I can, I'm going to go learn to drive. And then the teenager sets out about learning to drive because of some other motivation. But systems that are able to identify, for example, tumors in uh, images of medical data, these are systems that are still very much designed by human beings. Even, for example, uh, Alpha Zero, the, uh, the system that learned to play Go, the, the game that's kind of like Go, and then they later used it for chess. It, it doesn't learn from humans. It plays against itself. But the humans still have to set everything up. And the other thing is it's, it's only good at the one thing it learns. And so there's this problem of forgetting, where a system that learns to do one thing forgets to do learn how to do whatever it may have learned before. And there are people working on trying to fix that, um, but it's still a, a significant problem in the modern research community. And that's a big difference between human uh, performance and machine performance. Fascinating. Excellent. All right. So, Scott, what do you think the future of AI will look like? What do you see some trends that are maybe exciting? As we, we've kind of talked on, on both sides of the fence, we've got exciting things happening, but also maybe some, we've talked a lot about some concerning things, but what do you see coming down the pike? Okay. Well, it's still a concerning thing. Um, I think we're seeing this all over the place. John mentioned facial recognition and, yeah, surveillance in general. AI systems are um, biased towards harvesting large amounts of data from people. And so great for surveillance. And so I think we're going to see increasing trends of employees being tracked. I think we're going to see union uh, action where employees are going to push back against, you know, having to wear a Fitbit at all times while they're wow. on the job. Um, I think this is going to become more and more of an issue as we go on. Now, I want to say one more thing about that, and that is that um, – through social media and through all these connected devices, I think we're living in an era in which children growing up now will never have had a time in their life all of their activities are not logged for posterity. And yep. I think this is new and different. I, I don't know what the word for this is. Sort of on my own, I, I call it generation docs. Docs being the word that, you know, when you expose the private details of someone, you dox them. So mm -hmm. I think that's one thing is surveillance in general. But also, so I'm very much involved in creative applications of AI, AI for artists and musicians and developing systems where people can train their own models to generate music or help them find music or refine their artwork. And so I think they're gonna, we're also going to see some increasing applications in that area. In fact, already um, Adobe Photoshop if you um, if you look in Adobe Photoshop, if you download it and look through the files, they've already got TensorFlow as part of Adobe Photoshop. TensorFlow is a neural network application package for AI research, and um, Adobe has it built in now. They're not touting that fact. We may not see – I mean, a lot of companies want to announce the fact that they're using AI for this and that, but I think in other cases, we'll just see new capabilities arise that maybe we didn't even know were AI, but they – they kind of are. Right, right. Just like, um, you know, we don't necessarily understand all that Alexa and the previous precursor, Eliza, offer, but now that it is here, we've just accepted it. It's, you know, part of our, the application. Interesting. What about you, John? Yeah, I, I, I think that um, AI is going to help us in whole areas of logistics, particularly in healthcare, you mm -hmm. know, which 
uh, the issues of, of, of organizing modern technological healthcare in the most efficient way possible is a huge issue. And, you know, AI has, has transformed you know, companies like Amazon, their ability to run warehouses and so on. And I think if you can have the same kind of uh, power used in, in helping hospitals run efficiently and helping the staff to use in the best possible way, I, I see that as a as potential huge, huge advances. I also feel that uh, AI systems collaborating with human clinicians could be extremely useful, uh, not least in reducing medical mistakes. I mean, mm -hmm. one of the tragic things that happens is when, because human beings are fallible, and, and sometimes as a doctor you just forget something, you forget to do an essential test, you forget about a possible diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So having a, a collaborating AI system that says, have you thought about this? Or, you know, what about that? And it, it is there as an, uh, not to take over control, it's still the human expert is in control, but just as a reminder and as, a, as, as an aid to reducing medical mistakes, I think could be a, make, make a real contribution. I like your word collaborating, um, that collaborative function, uh, as you're right, because even in education, uh, there may be something that we, you know, when you serve 120 kids a day, there may be one piece of information you have forgotten to check off. And so having that collaborative function doesn't mean that you have to bow to it, as you were kind of talking a little bit, uh, Scott, but just having that collaboration, I think, is is a positive. Yeah, it's interesting. Apparently, um, you know, with, with programs like Alpha Zero and so on, that uh, chess and uh, playing that the computers can always beat the humans but the most powerful chess players are what they call centaurs which is where there, there is a, a computer and a human being together working collaboratively huh. and, and they can be the computers how about that um, so there you go that, that, that's the way forward isn't it excellent excellent centaurs centaurs <laughs> well we have a, a signature question that we ask every time every guest and that is what's a metaphor to help us understand the subject? What's a metaphor to help us understand how AI and stories intersect? Who wants to go first? <laughs> After John has already told us we got to be careful of metaphors. <laughs> right. Yeah, I thought we hit that last time, actually. So when I mentioned Sorcerer's Apprentice as a metaphor, um, I was answering this question, only I answered it last time by mistake. So... Um, can I use that again, or do you want a different metaphor? No, a different great. metaphor. We'll let John go. No, it's <laughs> it's actually really great. Just remind us again um, of of your signature point in that why that would be the good metaphor. Yeah, well, because it's an automated system. To the Sorcerer's Apprentice, right? Mickey Mouse. He makes. He has something he wants done. He automates it by having these brooms do it for him. It scales in a really big way but ends up having some unintended consequences on the environment around him and because um, he didn't really know what he was doing. Um, and I, I think that's a useful metaphor just in the sense that, you know, it's not like the brooms became evil and decided they were going to rule the world or that there was some sentience behind them, but there was this automated task um, that when applied at scale, ended up having some seriously disastrous unintended consequences. And, okay, again, not that all AI narratives need to be disastrous and dystopian. <laughs> uh, but just noting that, yeah, we're talking about automating tasks. As that's kind of the main metaphor. We're not so much talking about creating a fellow, you know, human being-like thing, in my opinion. Right. Mm -hmm. Excellent. How about you, John? Yeah, well, thinking about words, I uh, there's a Jewish philosopher, Buber, Martin Buber, who uh, drew the distinction between what he called I-U relations and I-it relations. Uh, it's the difference between the relation we have with a real person, an I-U relationship, and a relationship we have with a thing, an it. And I just want to keep reminding myself and reminding others that a machine is an it. Uh, we, we relate to it, but in a different way. We must keep and protect the IU relationship for other humans uh, because there's something uniquely precious about that. So it's the difference between you and it. 
I absolutely love that. Pro- protect the relationship between humans. And Scott, uh, in some ways, I do wish we had you on FaceTime because we are actually able to see John and having that human interaction, even though it's far away and he's in the UK, um, it, it is helpful. Well, we, we, how many times have we sort of half jokingly <laughs> said, we need to go to the UK and do a tour because we've, we've interviewed, you're about maybe the fifth person from the UK we've interviewed. <laughs> Like, we need to do a tour and meet in person all these people we've already had hour long conversations with. Yeah. But we want to go sit right face to face. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Wow. <clears throat> this has been wonderful. It has, and I'm not signing off. You're not signing off. Nope, you are. I am. Okay. Because it's about me. It is about you. All right. Well, thank you, first of all, so much, John and Scott. Honestly, I feel very honored that you all have agreed to be on the, at the table with us. This has been a delightful conversation. Um, and so, uh, John, if if someone were to want to get a hold of you, where would they be able to find you? Yeah, I have a, w- a website, johnwyatt.com, and I can also be contacted through the Faraday Institute in Cambridge. Wonderful. We will put that on our show notes. How about you, Scott? Um, Twitter works really well for me. So uh, I had a musician Twitter account, which was just uh, Scott Hawley. But uh, as an academic, I am Dr. Scott Hawley, Dr. Scott Hawley, uh, all one word. And um, that's a great way to get in touch with me. There's also a link to my website from Twitter. Okay. Well, we will absolutely connect those uh, to our show notes. And again, thank you so much for joining us about these um, integrations of the human experience and how we need to really remember that it's not about the it, it's about the us and the you. And I really appreciate the the lessons that we've learned uh, as we've sat around the table tonight. Well, next week, we start a different topic completely, kind of shifting gears a little bit. We're talking with Carlton Hughes and the afterwards own Holland Webb about the impact of stories that fathers tell from two fathers. And we're going to learn how these tales influence our community. So if you have not subscribed to the Afterward Podcast at theafterwardpodcast.com, please take a moment to do that. Then you'll be up to date on all the latest Afterward informations with links to fabulous guests like these two gentlemen tonight. And as always, you are welcome at our table. Thank you very much for being here. 